Hey guys, so today we're going to be looking at some of the highlights of chapter 17 and 18, um, which is basically the era of expansion in Europe and kind of what life was like for people living in this time. Uh, so we're going to start by looking at kind of the rural areas and um, how people really farmed and worked the land. So traditionally, and this kind of goes back to the Middle Ages in Europe, is that people had what's called the open field system. So if you look on this map right here, um, you kind of notice around the village there are all these fields that are there for people to use. Uh, and basically what this was all about is that anybody in the town could use this land, uh, whether it was to grow crops or to graze their animals or to collect food or whatever else they needed to do. And it was land that was there for people to use as they needed to. Uh, however, things are going to start to change in the 18th century. So the first thing that changes is they eliminate what's called the fallow, or leaving land fallow. So this basically means that more land is being used to grow crops. Uh, basically, wheat drains nutrients from the soil, but crops like corn and potatoes allow you to use crops without draining some of those nutrients. So this allows for more food to be produced. However, what they also do is start the, something called the enclosure movement. So this is where landowners would basically take this land, which had been open field, and start closing it off with fences or hedges or something. So if you look at these two maps right here, the Great Heath over here is some of that open land, and you can see over here it's now been um, closed off in the field. Basically, this is going to really hurt kind of some of those poor people who had been using the open field system. So even though more food was available, less land was available to actually farm. Uh, so that kind of caused a big problem with the enclosure movement, really affected the ability of some of the poor people in the rural areas um, to be able to get the food sources that they needed. Another thing that changes in agri agriculture is something called the Dutch Initiative. So if you think about the Netherlands, um, it's kind of a swampy place to live. And basically what the Dutch figured out is how to drain the land, drain the swamps, um, in order to make land livable. This passes into England, which also um, is a pretty wet, rainy place. And so this just kind of allows more land to be able to be open, to be lived on and farmed on. Uh, so this really kind of changes the way people in the rural areas live. During this period, we're also going to see a really great, great um, expansion in population growth. So basically, the bubonic plague had been on and off since the Middle Ages. But around the 18th century, the bubonic plague just basically disappears. Uh, now, that had gotten rid of a lot of the population. Uh, but now that that major disease is not there, and of course there are other diseases, but now that the bubonic plague is gone, it's going to allow for the population to continue to grow. There are also some other pop or other reasons that the population continues to grow. Um, there is an improvement in the water supply and sewage. So in the way people dispose of their sewage, um, there are fewer water-based diseases like cholera. And because there is more water available that's cleaner, it allows people to live longer. There also is an increased food supply with some of the crops brought in from the New World. So there is uh, more food available and food that is more available to the poor populations, potato being a big one, and think like in Ireland. Uh, so with this um, new food supply and being able to make sure that the food supply doesn't die off either, it's going to allow for more people to um, be around. The population grows up uh, almost double in this time period, so that's a really big boost. And you can really see that in these charts here. So if you look at this first chart, this is the growth of population in England, and you can see how after 1750 it just goes straight up. Um, in other countries it is very similar, Italy, Spain. Russia uh, with very few dips in it. So really this is going to really change the number of people in Europe and it's going to lead to some challenges on its own. Like how do we support all these people? What are we going to do for jobs and wages and that sort of thing? Uh, but we're going to see this trend of population continue to rise in Europe. Uh, now in terms of the industry that grows on, because of the enclosure system, fewer people can be farmers. And so there's got to be some sort of new kind of industry that grows in these rural areas. And this is going to be something called the cottage industry. 
So the cottage industry implies that people are doing this um, work out of their own homes. So we're not talking about factories quite yet. But in the cottage industry, people are working from their homes. This is also known as the putting out system because basically what happens is whoever owns the production will put out the supplies or the resources into some of these um, individual family homes. And so like maybe one person's job is to shear the sheep and one person's job is to spin that wool and a thread and another person's job is to actually do the weaving and another person's job is to sew the clothing that comes out of that. Um, so every different cottage is going to have their own piece of production and this is going to be a family run business. Everybody in the family that works in cottage industry is going to be involved up to the women, the children, the men, everybody in the home is going to do this. And so this is going to lead to what we call the industrious revolution. This is not the same as the industrial revolution. It's kind of the beginnings of that. But basically what this means is we're seeing more people getting involved in industry over being involved in farming. And so basically what we're going to see here is more people working, particularly girls and women uh, who are going to be given more opportunities. Occasionally they will be working outside of the home. And this is going to really be the foundation for what will eventually become the industrial revolution with factories and that sort of thing. Uh, so there's a, there's a guy who you absolutely must know who kind of becomes a big name in this time period as industry is starting to change. And that guy is named Adam Smith. So Adam Smith writes this book called The Wealth of Nations. And in this book, he describes what is what he calls the invisible hand. So basically what he means by this is that the government should no longer be regulating uh, the economy. So this is what it means by economic liberalism. So basically, if you think about that word liberal, it means more open, more free. And that's what he thinks the economy should be. Um, this is also called laissez-faire or hands-off um, regulation. And the idea behind this is that the government's job is not to regulate the economy. They're to fight wars and to do that sign of, sort of thing, keep the peace. But when it comes to the economy, it's better if that invisible hand, which we can't see, but for some somehow makes the cycle of the economy always work if it just does its own thing. Um, this is the beginning of what we call free market capitalism. Uh, this is the foundation for today's capitalism. He's also really big on competition, allowing businesses to be able to compete with each other. And in a lot of ways, Adam Smith is a big reaction to mercantilism that we have been seeing so far. He's also a reaction to some of the guild regulations that have been um, going on in Europe since the Middle Ages. So the thing to remember about, him, about Adam Smith is the cutback on regulation, this kind of new free market sort of economy. And this is really going to, again, lay that foundation for the Industrial Revolution that's coming. Uh, so the next thing that we have is trade itself. Uh, so this is kind of where mercantilism is kind of doing its thing. There's also going to be this rise of plantation agriculture in the New World particularly. And there's a lot of people who are involved in this. Um, so for the British, their Atlantic trade really depends on exports. They don't um, kind of grow a lot of their own things. So they depend on the exports from the colonies and trading it with the rest of the world. The French export a few things, particularly coffee and sugar are their biggest. Haiti is the... Um, their most important sugar colony. St. Domingue is what it was called at the time. And the Spanish are actually doing something called debt peonage. So they're going to be mostly in like the California area. They also take over the Louisiana territory before Napoleon snatches it back. And what they do on their colonies is they don't use slaves in particularly, but they have this kind of system which ensures that they've got free workers, right? So that might sound like slavery, and it kind of is. And basically what it means is the um, plantation system is set up to ensure that the workers are always in debt to um, the plantation owners. So they have to continue working for the plantation owners for basically free because their salary goes to paying off those debts. And this is kind of a form of debt slavery. Uh, but of course, this plantation agriculture and this kind of in, uh, resilience and uh, um, this dependence on it is going to lead to a sharp increase in the slave trade. And there is going to be thousands of Africans who are moved from Africa to the American colonies in 1750s alone. For the 100 years between 1750 and 1850, there are over 6 million Africans who are uh, transported from Africa 
And of course, this is going to lead to some people starting to question whether, because of the Enlightenment, people are going to start to question whether slavery is um, moral or ethical. And there are going to be people who start pushing for the abolition of slavery, but that's going to come much later in the 19th century. And part of this new interaction um, with the Europe and the Atlantic world is going to lead some different identities and communities in the Atlantic world. So first of all, we've got a group known as the Creole. So the the Creole are Spanish descent, but born in the Americas. So they are not born in Spain. They're born in the Americas, but they are of Spanish descent. And these are going to be kind of the people who are in charge of the plantations, the upper middle classes in the New World themselves. Uh, and they're going to kind of be developing their own unique kind of culture where they see themselves as American, South American, rather than seeing themselves as Spanish. And there's going to be a lot of resistance between the Creole and the Spanish. Uh, we also see a, a sharp increase in mixed race populations. Uh, so there's a lot of terms that are thrown around, particularly in the Spanish colonies, for these mixed race um, groups. So you will have a mixture of white and black, would be known as mulatto, a mixture of... Um, American or white and Native American is mestizo. Uh, you'll have different names for Creoles who marry um, mulattoes. And there's just this very organized system of race that's divided up in a very enlightenment type way in uh, the colonies. The other big thing that we're going to be seeing here is that a lot of uh, Jewish people are going to leave Europe in order to kind of try and get involved in this new market in the um, colonies. And they do, uh, they are able to establish some very distinct Jewish communities in the colonies. However, uh, there is a lot of discrimination. They don't have a lot of the same privileges that the Christian communities do in the New World. Uh, so this picture over here, you can just see where those major plantations are. Brazil has one of the biggest sugar plantations. And in fact, most of the slaves in the New World are in Brazil. We're talking like 40% of the slaves in the New World are actually in Brazil, where less than 6% are in North America. Uh, this is just a picture of a painting showing... Um, some of that mixed race culture here. These are known as mulatto paintings. It's actually a series of specific paintings that were done. So you can see in this portrait a Spanish descent man, probably a Creole, a black woman, and a mixed race child, a mulatto, in the painting. And so this just kind of to show some of that um, culture that was going on here. So going back to culture, particularly in Europe, we are going to see a lot of effects because of this new kind of change in work and um, trade and that sort of thing, increased interaction. So the first thing that we're going to see is most of the people in Europe are going to live in a nuclear family. There's not going to be a lot of extended family. And because that nuclear family, which is a man and his wife and their children, because they're not living with um, other people who can support them, a lot of them are going to put off getting married until they're much older than they had been before. Um, the average age for men and women to be married in this time is between 25 and 27. So that's much older than men, men and women had been married earlier. Uh, and part of it is because they want to be able to support themselves away from their families. So they're basically waiting to get married so that they are financially stable. This is going to lead to a stable economy, but it's also going to lead to an, a decrease in the number of children that couples have. Uh, and so that's kind of something else to really think about. Uh, another opportunity that we have during this is more and more people are working away from home. So for boys, a lot of young men um, will take apprenticeships. So around the age of seven, they will be apprenticed off uh, to some sort of trade, whether that's working in a store, working you know, in a silversmith or something like that. They will be trained until they are in their early 20s, and they become a master of the trade themselves, and then they can set up their own business. For girls, there is more of an opportunity in some of these new industries that are developing, particularly in the textile industries. However, women are being paid less, uh, and there is fewer opportunity in other parts of um, the world to have jobs. And most of the jobs that women are going to take are domestic servant positions. Um, so working as a nursemaid for um, a wealthy family for their children or um, as a governess of some kind or maybe working as a cook or a maid in their homes. Um, but we are seeing more young people working away from the home um, rather than working in the home itself. 
In terms of child care, um, there are kind of some changes in the way child care happens in this period. So the first thing to note is that there is a very high mortality of child care um, or for infants in this time. Uh, men and women in a marriage might have 10 pregnancies, but only two children live past the age of two or three. Uh, this is because there are a lot of early childhood diseases that there were not vaccinations for. Um, they might be get an infection of some kind. Um, basically, there are diseases that are going to affect children a lot more than they affect the adults. And in fact, a lot of people didn't even name their children until the age of two, um, just kind of expecting that the child might not live to that age. Uh, in terms of the way childs are children are cared for when they are young, um, there obviously are two ways to feed your children. And the main way is breastfeeding. So breastfeeding is actually going to kind of have a stigma on it in the 18th century, where really it's something that only like poor people do. Only poor people feed their own children. Instead, wealthy women are going to have what's called a wet nurse. So what they're going to do is when they have a child, rather than feeding that child themselves, they're going to find a young woman in the town who has also just had a child and pay her to nurse her own children, pay the poor woman to nurse the wealthy woman's children. Uh, for poor women, breastfeeding was important because it could delay having other children. Um, and for wealthy women, they wanted to keep having more children. Uh, but there does be kind of come this competition between the two and the stigma that if you feed your own children, then you're poor, right? Um, during this time period, there also, because people are so worried about being able to support their children, there is kind of a worry about having too many children. Birth control doesn't really exist. And so if a woman is does get pregnant when she doesn't think she can raise this child, um, she's kind of caught to, she gets into a pickle, basically. There's no way to have an abortion, really. Abortions are illegal and extremely dangerous. There's not really a good way to do it. So abortion rate is pretty low. But what a lot of women will actually do is when the child is born, if she doesn't feel like she can take care of the child or maybe the child is illegitimate and the husband or the father refused to marry the mother, um, for whatever reason, if she doesn't think that she can care for the child, then there is this um, series of infanticide, which basically means that the woman murders her child. Um, often they would smother their children or leave them out to the elements. And this happened quite a bit. It was illegal. It was frowned upon. But it was something that a lot of, it, a lot of women did. If the woman could not um, bring herself to kill her child, what she might do is abandon the child at what's called a, fan, a foundling house. This would be an orphanage. Um, and so the child would be raised there. But I mean, even that was pretty bad. You're pretty much guaranteeing that your child's going to have a terrible life. Adoption doesn't really happen the same way it does today. And actually the mortality rate because of the poor conditions in these orphanages was anywhere between 50 to 90%. So even if within the foundling house, um, Conditions are pretty bad. If you've ever seen like Oliver Twist, right? That's kind of what that's all about. Uh, in terms of the attitudes towards raising children, for at least while the child is very young, there is actually this kind of emotional distance that a lot of parents have towards their children. It's kind of a defense mechanism in case the child does die. Um, of course, that's not true of all people. There are, you know, accounts of people who really did love their child and felt um, really depressed and very sad when the child would die. But there is kind of this idea that we are going to put some emotional distance between you and your child. And this is especially true of the wealthy, where they might not even be raising their own children. They might have a nanny to raise their children. Um, there are also the child, the uh, philosophy of raising children is that there's got to be some severe discipline for these kids. The phrase um, spare the rod and spoil the child comes out around this time. And what that means is basically if you don't beat your kid, they're going to grow up to be spoiled. So this idea of threatening and even following through with, um, you know, whippings and that sort of thing is going to raise a better child. Uh, some of this is questioned by the Enlightenment, uh, but there is also this kind of push with the Enlightenment, especially for things like education. And so there are going to be more educational opportunities available for young children, um, particularly in the state, um, in places where 
Uh, Protestantism is big. Uh, there's going to be re some religious schools. The Catholic Church has set up religious schools. The Presbyterian Church sets up religious schools in Scotland. Uh, but we're also going to see like places like Austria and Prussia, where Joseph II and Maria Theresa set up state-run public schools uh, for the children in that area. In terms of popular culture, there is a high increase in literacy during this time, so more books are available to more people um, of all social classes. Uh, the culture itself is a very community-focused culture. Uh, you're very much involved in what goes on with all of the people in your town or your city. Uh, and then, of course, there are... Um, a lot of festivals, especially associated with the Catholic Church, things like Carnival, which become really popular um, for a lot of people in this time. During this period, we're also going to see a movement towards a consumer society. So the consumer revolution basically just means that people are now able to buy things for the sake of buying them, not because they need them, but because they want them, right? So there's going to be this movement towards buying goods and things, luxury items that you may not have necessarily been able to afford before, but now that you can buy them, you do by them. Uh, a big one in this time period is clothing. This is going to be a really big period for women's fashion um, with new and different kinds of clothing, especially because a lot of the industries were textile industries. We're also going to see new attitudes towards space in your home. So basically the way we think about the home today where we have a room that is for cooking and a room that is for sleeping and a room that is for play those rooms didn't really exist before this time period, but people kind of start changing the way they see their home. Um, we're also going to see an increase in hygiene in this time. People who had maybe never bathed in their life are suddenly going to start bathing more. So ba basically there's going to be more health, more public health happens um, in this period. And then, of course, um, the church plays a pretty big role in this as well. Uh, in terms of the church itself, there is an increased state control of the church. So rather than the pope or rather than a religious organization controlling the church, the monarch or the um, parliament or whoever is going to be the control of the church, there is also a... Um, movement to abolish some of the religious orders that have come around. So orders like the Jesuits, uh, basically there is this like idea of corruption uh, between some of these religious orders. So they are um, abolished by a lot of the leaders of this period, again, particularly the Catholics. Um, and there's also a religious revival, both in the Catholic church and in Protestant churches. Um, there was this kind of idea that the church had gotten a little lax in their beliefs. That's kind of what this political cartoon is looking at. So a lot a lot of Protestant churches really felt the need for renewal of pietism, so a renewal of um, being more religious and more worshipful. One of the ones that comes out of this is the Methodist movement. The Methodist movement is led by a guy named John Wesley, and basically they're trying to clean up the church, right? Um, it is kind of this idea that the church has gotten off track. We want to get back to it. Uh, in the Catholic Church, there's a very similar revival movement called the Jainicism. Um, so that's kind of what that's all about. And basically what there's this need to do is to purify some of the superstitions that were going on. There were a lot of people who still practiced what, they were, what were considered pagan superstitions. So what the revival movement really wanted to do was to clean up some of that kind of spirituality of paganism that was still happening. The last thing I want to talk about is medical practice. So medicine is one of those really tricky things in history. And a lot of people actually really thought that medicine didn't help. It was only God could heal the sick. And so a lot of people went to faith healers. Um, and they used kind of like potions or things that they made out of herbs in order to help. Um, but we're also going to see an increase in doctors who study as well. And it used to be that doctors kind of um, apprentice the same way anybody else would with a former doctor. But we are going to see some medical schools open up. There becomes a greater understanding of the human anatomy. Anesthesia becomes a big thing for the first time, particularly on you know the battlefield where you might have to do an amputation right on the battlefield. Some new kinds of anesthesia come around um, where we can actually do surgeries. If you think about it, the surgery is so painful that the surgery could kill you from shock. But now that we can do anesthesia, we can actually operate on you. Um, and there is also a um, movement for women, midwifery, or you know, women who uh, help other women give birth. That's kind of where women are involved in medicine. They're not allowed to be physicians, but they do kind of are able to help with female problems, as it were. 
Uh, but probably the biggest movement in medicine in this time is smallpox. So smallpox gets the nickname the Great Killer. Uh, basically, when the bubonic plague died out, smallpox kind of takes its place as the disease to be feared. And it's a very contagious disease, and it kills lots of people very quickly. So in the early 17th century, um, there is this development where people call inoculation, where they found out that if you introduce smallpox to someone, then there is a chance, a small amount of smallpox, they may be able to fight it off. So basically what they would do is they would take pus from the pox of a very sick person, they make a little slit into your arm and introduce that pus into your bloodstream. I know it's really gross, um, but the idea is that maybe if you are introduced to that tiny little amount of pus that your body might, you know, they didn't know what it was doing, but maybe your body would build antibodies and you would be able to fight it off. Of course, the risk is very high. About half of the people who are inoculated actually get smallpox from the inoculation, but it is a way to fight it off. Um, but it's not perfect. Until a guy named Edward Jenner in the 18th century realized that he saw, um, he noticed that milkmaids didn't really get smallpox. And see, milkmaids, they were always around cows, right? Well, cows got a disease called cowpox. I know, right? Um, really creative. And what he realized is that if these milkmaids were exposed to cowpox, that they didn't get smallpox. And cowpox was not nearly as deadly as smallpox was. It was kind of like chickenpox, right? And so what he did is he developed the world's first vaccine, which is a smallpox vaccine, which introduces, instead of smallpox, it introduces a little bit of cowpox to your system, which is not nearly as deadly, and it allows you to fight off smallpox because they're of the same family of diseases. Uh, so this is a really big movement in medicine. Um, so this kind of wraps up what we are talking about here. I hope that's a good highlight for you, and we will talk to you soon. Bye-bye.